Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mara Carlin, performing the duties of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, who will provide some brief remarks about the AUKUS Optimal Pathway announced by President Biden yesterday. This is a trilateral commitments-based phase plan for Australia to, to acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, please note Dr. Carlin will have time uh, for a few questions uh, afterwards and then must depart. Um, I'd ask that you please limit your questions to AUKUS, given that's her focus here today. Uh, and then after a brief pause, I'll stick around to provide some non-AUKUS updates and answer questions as well. So thank you for your assistance on this. Dr. Carlin, over to you, ma'am. All right. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. It's great to see you all. Yesterday, you heard from President Biden, Prime Minister Albanese, and Prime Minister Sunak on the agreement for Australia to acquire a conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarine capability through the Australia-United Kingdom-United States Enhanced Security Partnership, or AUKUS. Yesterday concluded our 18-month thorough and expert-led consultation period to identify the optimal pathway for Australia to acquire this capability while setting the highest nuclear non-proliferation standard. This plan will deliver on that commitment and lift all three nations' submarine industrial bases and undersea capabilities, enhancing deterrence and promoting stability in the Indo-Pacific. For the last seven decades, our three countries have stood shoulder to shoulder, along with our allies and partners, to help sustain peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. The optimal pathway will sustain that in the decisive decades ahead. As the national security strategy and national defense strategy describe, the United States must pursue a free, open, and secure world to protect our national interests and those of our allies and our partners. AUKUS advances this goal by building our military capabilities and those of two of our very closest allies, enabling closer military planning and cooperation. It is a generational opportunity to enhance the national security of all three nations. As the President shared in his remarks yesterday, the optimal pathway will deliver deterrence across several phases. Under the first phase of the optimal pathway, the United States and the United Kingdom will immediately increase port visits of conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines in Australia, and then, as early as 2027, will begin rotating through Australia under Submarine Rotational Force West. This deployment will ensure Australian personnel can continue familiarizing themselves with how these vessels operate, how they are properly maintained, and how we can continue safely operating together. The increased presence of U.S. submarines will buttress regional stability and support the safe development of Australian stewardship of its own sovereign, conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarine enterprise. In the next phase, the United States intends to sell three Virginia-class submarines to Australia in the 2030s, with the potential to sell up to tw two more if needed. This will provide Australia with a conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarine capability prior to their enduring sovereign capability coming online you will see three allied and highly interoperable SSN fleets operating in the Indo-Pacific. The final phase will be our support for what we call SSN AUKUS, a next generation conventionally armed nuclear powered submarine designed and constructed by Australia and the UK and incorporating cutting edge US technologies in the propulsion plant, combat control and weapon systems. Australia's acquisition of SSNs will bolster the capabilities of one of our strongest allies by increasing the Royal Australian Navy's range, survivability, and striking power, thus strengthening deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. Every phase of the optimal pathway will set the highest nuclear nonproliferation standards. Moreover, AUKUS will diversify U.S. posture in the Indo-Pacific, offering new locations from which U.S. forces can operate. And AUKUS will strengthen U.S. and allied submarine industrial capacity, which is key to modernizing, innovating, and maintaining our military and economic competitive edge today and in the future. Three highly capable allied and interoperable submarine forces will strengthen U.S. national security and buttress stability in the Indo-Pacific for decades to come. We are also working to modernize our information sharing and export control systems, which is necessary for the effective implementation of AUKUS. As the National Defense Strategy outlines, the capacity to share information with key allies and partners is of critical importance to how the United States deters aggression and succeeds in contingencies. We will work closely with the U.S. government, including the Congress, of course, and the United Kingdom and Australia, to identify obstacles to information sharing and to develop innovative, rapid, and scalable solutions to, to deliver on the President's vision for this historic partnership. And with that, I'd be delighted to take your questions. Thank you very much, ma'am. All right, go out to the eyes for questions. Yes, sir. Um, I want to ask, uh, sorry. 
Um, have you had any uh, direct communications with other militaries um, uh, airing concerns or issues about the AUKUS deal? And if so, what have they been? And also, just on um, the selection of the Virginia-class submarines that you, you will eventually sell to Australia, what's the criteria for which submarines you select and, how, and when you deliver them? I want to make sure I understand the first part of your questions. When you've talked about communications with militaries, are you citing specific allies, partners? Anyone at all from China to Asian countries, any other foreign military? Great. Uh, we have had a number of conversations with our allies and our partners in civilian channels and military channels, of course, um, throughout the cons consultative period and then, of course, in the run-up to yesterday's announcement and have heard a uh, substantial amount of enthusiasm from them for this historic, game-changing uh, partnership. Regarding engagements with the People's Republic of China, the State Department did do that, and I would refer to you, you, I would refer you to them for the substance of that dialogue. I would, of course, highlight what you've heard often from Secretary Austin, which is that open communication between our two countries is important for risk management and for understanding what one another is thinking. And then on your second question regarding uh, Virginia, um, you know, why, why we chose that, we looked at a wide number of options. It has been a robust and very busy 18 months of, uh, of consultations and trying to look at wide variety of options. In terms of which submarine specifically will go, uh, that will, will go to rotate for submarine uh, rotational forces west. That's really going to be figured out through our normal military processes of, uh, of such efforts. Okay, uh, thank you very much for doing this. I have two questions about the submarine rotational force west. Uh, can you say the new rotational force will increase the total number of U.S. submarines operating in the Western Pacific compared to today? And then do you have another question? Oh, yeah. Then, then secondly, uh, can you tell us, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about the advantage of having a rotational presence of the U.S. submarine outside of the second iron chain uh, in terms of deterring Chinese aggression in the region? All right, uh, on, on that first one, uh, having three allies operating capable submarines uh, around the Indo-Pacific is really critical for security and stability. And I think that really tracks nicely to your next question, which look, to be very clear, AUKUS is not about any one country. It is about the need for security, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. And our three countries, of course, have a robust uh, history of collaborating together. This is going to take us to another level of interoperability. I would highlight the significance of sharing this information with Australia. As you all probably know, the last time we did so, it was 1958. So it's really a sign of just how close this relationship is. For that to really occur in a responsible way, it's important that Australia develop stewardship practices. And that's why we have developed this multi-phased mutual commitments approach. Thank you. Let's go to Will. Thank you. Um, just regarding the um, the Virginia class submarines that um, that Australia will purchase in the 2030s, has has a specific model been selected, um, or is that something that's a little bit down the road? And is, will it basically be what's on the production line for the, the U.S. is purchasing at that point? Will they be equipped with the the VPM um, to increase missile capacity, or is it something tailored to Australia specifically? So first of all, it's worth noting that uh, Australia will get these subs in just about a decade. That is, frankly, faster than I suspect a lot of folks might have expected when this whole uh, effort was announced just 18 months ago. Um, Australia will be purchasing a mix of new, new submarines and old submarines. And it, uh, right now, it looks like it will be two with the potential to have, excuse me, it will be three with the potential for two more uh, if needed. As I noted earlier, uh, the, the cohort of folks looked at a wide range of different options and really came, came down with Virginia as the right, as the right approach, uh, and Virginia payload module will not be, be a part of it. I think the three countries saw that that, that, that didn't uh, make sense. Uh, as, as you no doubt know well, of course, these submarines are going to be especially special, though, because of their stealth, their range, and their endurance. So they really will, will be kind of a meaningful, um, meaningful deterrent in the region. Go to Jim. Hi, it's good to see you. Um, on the info sharing, going back to the question you answered just just a little bit before, is that is that a real showstopper? I mean, these these countries are all five eye participants. 
you don't really anticipate that being a, a, a problem with the info sharing with Australia, do you? You know, Jim, uh, allies and partners are at the heart of the national defense strategy, right? They're a center of gravity for realizing that 2022 national defense strategy. And we know we have to lower the barriers to working with them. And information is just a piece of it. You are exactly right that these are two of our very closest allies who we have stood shoulder to shoulder with for much of the last hundred years or so. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, we have processes that have to be figured out. And to ensure that both pillars of AUKUS, right, there are two pillars. Today, we're very focused on Pillar 1, which is the, uh, the, the conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. But there's also Pillar 2, right, this cooperation on advanced capabilities. We know for that to be realized, we're going to need very uh, clear, transparent, robust information sharing practices. It's a great case study. These are exactly the right two allies to make it real. And we look forward to working with our colleagues uh, around the U.S. government, including the Congress, to, to make that a reality. We have time for just a couple more. Joe? I, hi. Thanks for doing this. Um, Joe Gould, Defense News. Um, just to follow up on Jim's question, I mean, what are the, can you drill down a little bit to talk about what are the specific obstacles? Do you have a sense, I mean, after 18 months, do you have a sense of what some of the, the pieces of ITAR um, and what kind of information sharing um, needs to get changed? You know, Joe, we've spent a lot of time over these last 18 months figuring out how we can ensure that we deliver on this historic game-changing pledge by the three heads of state. And so we've looked hard at the different changes that might need to happen, but I would say that there, there's probably more to be done uh, along those lines. But I can assure you that we will do all we can to both deliver on the submarines and to deliver on the advanced capabilities piece. We are in very close consultation with our colleagues at the State Department on the ITAR piece specifically and also with our, our colleagues in, in Congress. But on the whole, I think we've all been pleased to see robust bipartisan support for making this a reality and really recognizing the sort of generational leap that we see in this alliance. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate right. your time Thank today. You. Thank you all very much. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, so first of all, um, I would like to highlight U.S. European Command's statement released earlier today confirming that two Russian Su-27 aircraft conducted unsafe and unprofessional, inter and unprofessional intercept uh, with a U.S. Air Force intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance unmanned MQ-9 aircraft that was operating within international airspace over the Black Sea today. Uh, to recap, at approximately 7.03 a.m. Central European time, one of the Russian Su-27 aircraft struck the propeller of the MQ-9, causing U.S. forces to have to bring the MQ-9 down in international waters. Several times before the collision, the Su-27s dumped fuel on and flew in front of the MQ-9 in a reckless and unprofessional manner. This incident demonstrates a lack of competence in addition to being unsafe and unprofessional. U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Air Forces Africa, routinely fly aircraft throughout Europe over sovereign territory and throughout international airspace in coordination with applicable host nation and international laws. In order to bolster collective European defense and security, these missions support allied partner and U.S. national objectives. As the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Air Forces Africa commander emphasized in European Command Statement, quote, U.S. and Allied aircraft will continue to operate in international airspace, and we call on the Russians to con conduct themselves professionally and safely. In separate news, Secretary Austin concluded a successful visit to the Middle East region last week, where he met with leaders in Jordan, Iraq, Egypt, and Israel. The week-long trip served to deepen defense partnerships and enable the exchange of views on shared regional and global security challenges. Specific topics of discussion included ongoing coalition-led defeat ISIS operations in Iraq and Syria, the concerning range of threats posed by Iran, including its destabilizing regional activities and provision of unmanned aerial systems to Russia for use in their unprovoked war against Ukraine, 
and implementing commitments made by Israeli and Pan Palestinian senior officials in Aqaba, Jordan, and the importance of de-escalating violence and restoring calm in the West Bank. The Secretary also had the opportunity to talk to a number of U.S. service members currently serving in the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility and thank them for, and their families for their commitment to mission service and safeguarding our nation. And finally, Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, will host the 10th meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group tomorrow. The meeting will be hosted virtually here in the Pentagon and will allow for the Secretary, the Chairman, and senior defense leaders from around the world to discuss ongoing efforts to provide Ukraine with the means and resources it needs to defend itself from Russian aggression. Additional information on tomorrow's meeting will be forthcoming. And with that, I will take your questions. We'll start with Reuters. Phil. Or anyone else in the U.S. military reached out to uh, his Russian counterpart or any, anyone else's counterparts uh, from Russia. And uh, regarding the MQ-9, uh, you know, what, what can you detail a little bit more what its mission was and where it was being piloted from? Please. Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of uh, Secretary Austin uh, talking to his counterpart, not at this time, uh, to my knowledge, uh, DOD officials have not spoken specifically to uh, Russian authorities on this particular incident. I do know that the State Department is raising our concerns about the incident directly with the Russian government, so I'd refer you to them for details on that. Um, in terms of the, the mission of the MQ-9, as I mentioned, it's an ISR platform. Um, you know, these, these aircraft have been flying over the Black Sea region for some time, to include before the current conflict started. Uh, it is an important and busy international waterway. Uh, and so it is uh, not an uncommon mission for us to be flying in international airspace. And, and so what kind of precautions would you take going forward? Is there have uh, armed uh, accompanying aircraft or uh, well, and was this aircraft armed? Uh, so I'm not going to get into the specific uh, profile of this particular aircraft. As you know, the MQ-9 does have the ability to be armed. Um, it was, again, conducting an ISR mission uh, in international airspace. Uh, something that we've been doing for some time. Uh, in terms of uh, the types of tactic techniques and procedures that we take to protect our aircraft, I'm not going to get into the specifics. I think the key point here is that uh, while intercepts in and of themselves are not that uncommon, uh, the fact that this type of behavior from these Russian pilots, that is uncommon and unfortunate and unsafe. And so, uh, again, would echo General Hecker's call on the Russians to continue to fly safely. Thank you. Liz? Thank you, Bob. Um, yes. Was this collision itself an accident on Russia's behalf, and is the U.S. responding as such? Um, so, you know, we are uh, continuing to assess exactly what happened, but I think um, based on the actions of the Russian pilots, it's clear that it was unsafe, unprofessional. Um, and I think the actions speak for themselves. Um, what we what we saw again were, were fighter aircraft dumping fuel in front of this uh, UAV, uh, and then getting so close to the aircraft that it actually damaged the propeller on the MQ-9. Uh, we we assess that it likely caused some damage to the Russian aircraft as well. Um, to our knowledge, well, we know that the aircraft. Uh, the Russian aircraft did land. I'm not going to go into where they landed. Um, but again, it's just demonstrative of uh, very unprofessional, unsafe airmanship on the part of these pilots. Thank you. Uh, one one yep. more question, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, will the U.S. try to recover this drone? Uh, so I'm not, I don't have anything right now to provide in terms of recovery operations. If we have any updates to provide, we'll be sure to do that. Thanks. David. Is there video? of the incident? Are you going to release the video? Um, where in the Black Sea did it happen? How close to Russian airspace? And um, did you say that this particular Reaper was unarmed? Uh, again, I didn't say uh, whether it was or was not. I'm not going to get into the particular mission profile of this aircraft. It was conducting an, an ISR mission. Um, in terms of the specifics, David, I'm not going to at this point be able to get more specific other than the Black Sea region in international air, airspace, uh, well, well clear of, uh, of any type of, um, yeah, it was international airspace. Um, and then I'm sorry, the other part of your question? The video. video. Yes, yeah, so we are going through the, the declassification process now, uh, and we'll keep you updated on that front.
in terms of uh, imagery associated with this incident. Travis. I'm laser focused on your question. <laughs> that was just a very quick one. Um, you haven't said Reaper, but he said Reaper. Is it accurate to say it's MQ-9 Reaper? Uh, I'm just going to stick with MQ-9. Yep, thanks. Joe. All right, thanks so much, Pat. Um, the uh, An MQ-9 uh, potentially contains some sensitive technology. Is the uh, U.S. military undertaking any effort to recover the MQ-9? Is it in the is it in the waters of the Black Sea? Has Russia recovered it? Um, is there a U.S. naval asset in the in the region that could undertake that recovery? Thanks. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what's on this particular aircraft, um, other than again, it's an ISR platform. Uh, because of the damage, uh, we were uh, in a position to have to essentially um, crash it into the Black Sea. Uh, to my knowledge, at this point in time, uh, the Russians have not recovered that aircraft. Um, but again, in terms of um, our recovery efforts, don't have any updates to provide right now. I'd refer you to Navier in terms of what assets they may have in that region. Thank you. Janie? Thank you, General. Uh, Regarding the North Korea's submarine launch uh, strategic cruise missiles recently, North Korea has announced that it is possible to mount a nuclear warhead on a strategic cruise missiles. What is the readiness of the United States against escalate provocations such as the nuclear provocation by the North Korea? Let me just make sure I understand. Uh, what's the readiness of the U.S. to respond to a nuclear provocation by North Korea? Um, well, I think we've been very clear uh, that were North Korea to employ a nuclear weapon, it would be the end of the North Korean regime. Uh, but again, our focus continues to be on working very closely with our allies and our partners in the region to deter aggression, uh, to preserve security and stability in the region, and that will continue to be our, our focus. You go to Carla. Just a real quick clarification. What did the fighter jet, what did he, he strike the, the MQ-9 with? Was it the wing? Was it the, the tail? Uh, I can't tell you specifically what portion of the aircraft, but uh, it's the fact that it essentially ran into the MQ-9. Okay, thank you. And then just separately on Ukraine, there's reports out there from the, the battlefield that the Ukrainians are running out of munitions. They're having shortages. Uh, is that a concern for the Pentagon, and what's the Pentagon doing to alleviate that problem? Yeah, so as we've been doing since the beginning of this campaign, we're continuing to do everything that we can to ensure that we're meeting Ukraine's needs, whether it's ammunition, uh, whether it's air defense, armor. Uh, you know, you've heard us talk extensively about that. Tomorrow's discussion, of course, will be another opportunity to bring the international community together to focus on Ukraine's most urgent needs, to include ammunition. And so, uh, again, that will continue to be our focus. And, and you've heard Secretary Austin and others say that we're committed to making sure that they have what they need to be successful. Is there an assessment on why they're running out of ammunition? I'm sorry. Thanks. Is there an assessment that the Pentagon has on why they're running out of ammunition? Is it because they're just expending it too fast? Is it not making it to the battlefield in time? What's your assessment? So, yeah, really. So I'd have to refer you to the Ukrainians to talk about their specific um, efforts to supply their individual units. Uh, again, we're working very closely with them and our international partners to get them what they need. Um, and, and I think it's also important to kind of take a step back and look at the progress that has been made while recognizing the fact that there still is a tough fight ahead, uh, particularly as we go into the, the spring and summer. And so our, our focus, again, is going to be working with national armaments directors, uh, with the Ukrainians to get them the ammunition they need and get that to the frontline units as quickly as possible. Let me go back over to this side of the room. Yes, sir. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Can you guide us through the timeline of the MQ-9 intercept? Uh, we have that the uh, aircraft was struck at 7.03 Eastern time, but uh, how long were the Sukhois with the aircraft beforehand? And were there any radio calls between uh, radio communications either from the Russians or from the United States? Yeah, so on the latter part of your question, no, none that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, it, I would ask that you go back and confirm this with UCOM, but, but based on the information I have here, it seems like uh, approximately 
30 to 40 minutes uh, they were flying in the vicinity of this MQ-9. Uh, and then at 7.03 uh, is when the um, 73 a.m. Central European time is when they collided, causing it to crash. So, Kasim. The U.S. forces has had to bring down the, um, the, the aircraft. Does that mean that uh, you United States piloted it to the crash site, or yes. was it struck by a missile? Or something? Yeah, we brought it down. Okay. Yep. And, and then also, um, is there any U.S. naval um, assets currently in, in uh, Black Sea? Again, I'd, I'd have to refer you to uh, Navier for any details on particular assets in the region. Thank you. Laura? Um, can you talk a little bit more about the damage to the MQ-9? I mean, was it unflyable, and, and that's why you had to bring it down? Um, and then can you say a little bit more about how often this kind of thing happens in uh, over the Black Sea, that Russian aircraft harass U.S. drones and, and other aircraft? Yeah, so I don't have any statistics in front of me in terms of intercepts, but again, uh, as I highlighted, uh, the fact that uh, intercepts of aircraft are not uncommon in and of themselves. It's, it's not obviously a daily occurrence. The vast majority of those uh, intercepts are uh, what we would consider safe and professional. Uh, just wanting to see what's there, right? You're flying alongside it to, uh, to be able to see what's there. Um, in this particular case though, again, uh, they collided with the aircraft, damaging the propeller uh, and essentially uh, putting in a situation where it was unflyable and uncontrollable, so we brought it down. Thank you. Time for a few more. I'll go here and then to the body. Hi, sir. Thanks. I uh, just wanted to check uh, just to confirm uh, any communication with uh, allies such as Turkey about potential recovery of the uh, drone, and is there any concern that Russia could provide uh, the drone to Iran if it recovers it? Uh, so that that would be a hypothetical. Uh, again. Russia does not have the drone, so that would be a hypothetical question. Um, in terms of uh, working with allies and partners, I don't have anything to announce here, but if and when we do, we'll be sure to let you know. Thank you. Go to Fadi, and then we'll come back over here to the last two. Yep. Uh, thank you, General. So when, um, I know you don't want to share lots of information, special intelligence information, but are you able to say whether the MQ-9 was flying um, near Ukraine or near the Crimea Peninsula. And then I, I believe you said, if I heard right, that the Russians did not recover the, uh, the drone. However, have you seen any effort by the Russian Navy to try to recover the drone? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so on, on your latter question there, Fadi, I'm not going to get into that. Um, in terms of where it was flying, um, it was well clear of any territory in Ukraine. It was over international, in international airspace, over international water. So, thank you. Nancy. Thank you. Um, during Secretary Austin's visit to Egypt, um, he held meetings with officials, even though all press were banned from covering it. Past defense chiefs, when they've been in a similar situation, have refused to proceed. Um, given that the Biden administration has said that one of its key pillars in terms of foreign policy is that when presented with the um, a choice between autocrats and democracies that it stands with democracies. Can you help us understand why the secretary decided to proceed with those trips given the ban and should we expect that going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our relationship with Egypt is obviously a very important uh, strategic partnership. Uh, the secretary did appreciate the opportunity to meet with his counterparts uh, and talk about that. I will tell you when it, come, when it came to the press coverage of that portion, uh, having uh, looked further into it, uh, the Egyptians loved, lived up to uh, what they had agreed upon. Uh, some of the lessons learned out of that was in terms of um, making sure that we were on the same sheet when it came to understanding uh, press access, and so we will continue to work that. I'm sorry, could you clarify the U.S. had agreed beforehand that there would be a ban of journalists? We did not agree to a ban on journalists. We, we agreed to have official photographers. We did have one reporter uh, come into one of the sessions, uh, but then a portion that was going to be open to the press was subsequently not held, and therefore uh, there was not an opportunity to cover that. But again, um, sometimes these meetings are, are very small. Sometimes there's not the opportunity for uh, media to come in, but again, it's something that we've noted, and we'll continue to work closely with governments as we visit to ensure that there's press access. Thank you. 
Sir. Uh, just uh, regarding the budget, uh, for the last few years, the services have pursued a divest to invest strategy, and Congress hasn't necessarily bought into that. This year, the Air Force is looking to retire more than 300 aircraft, double the amount last year. Again, Congress last year didn't give that full amount. Is there a sense that things have changed on the Hill, that there's a willingness to uh, approve greater divestment, uh, or is this now becoming kind of a cat and mouse game of shoot with a higher number knowing you're going to get less to try to get to where you want to be? Uh, well, when it comes to the Air Force budget specifically, I course would refer you to them to talk in specifics and, and I don't want to answer for Congress. What I will say uh, is having observed this process I do think like anything there's a continuing dialogue in terms of uh, what the services require to meet their mission requirements and, and working closely with Congress and with the Department of Defense to identify what those offsets might be in order to ensure uh, that we can modernize uh, you know throughout all the services. And so I think uh, in a lot of ways, uh, as that communication has increased, uh, you're seeing some of the, the fruits of that labor. But again, I'd refer you to the Air Force uh, for specifics on their budget. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.